Hello everyone, I'm Bob the Orc, and welcome to Conversations with Dad. This is episode number three. We're going to be talking about physical strength and health. And here we are. Hey Dad, how are you doing? Doing fine. Um, you'd just done a video which I watched. Uh, that kind of inspired this. Do you want to go into a little bit of what yeah, you covered so, in that video? Yeah, so uh, I was doing one of my uh, Don't Be Someone Else's Bitch videos talking about uh, the, the key uh, attributes that you need to build up for achieving success. And in the first video, I talked about the need for, for physical strength and health and how that's the building blocks of a lot of your other abilities that lead towards success. And, uh, and I talk about the need for physical strength, for health and lifestyle, and, and then building up your energy and, and, and therefore your confidence. And uh, I thought, since you're you're sort of an expert on on health and wellness, uh, I, let's let's go talk about some of that stuff. You recently watched the video, and uh, let's uh, let's let's dive right in. So, what what I take away from the video is that if you don't have physical strength, uh, life in general is just a lot harder emotionally, not only physically but emotionally as well. Uh, I was born in 1942. If you do the math, that puts me up at a pretty considerable age. <laughs> yeah. And I have the benefit of having grown up when there were steam locomotives pulling trains. Um, not commonly, but occasionally you'd see uh, farm wagons rolling through the little town I grew up in the Midwest. You'd see people, again, again not all the time, but you know, maybe 10% of the time or 5% of the time, a farmer would be out in the field uh, behind his horses uh, with a plow walking behind it. So I sort of span the time from very primitive ways of doing things with manual labor up to the current time where we sit hunched over a computer all day long. Uh, kids are going to school now. Uh, there's the pandemic on and you have these little kids just sitting hunched over a computer hours and hours and hours on end with yeah. no physical activity. And the interesting thing, uh, your brother uh, had an interesting idea some years ago. I'm a retired college teacher. I taught economics at the university level. Uh, worked for a while various financial institutions like the Federal Reserve Bank and so on. But uh, as you kids were growing up, uh, your mom was busy singing opera throughout the world. Uh, we live here in New York City, and I became a, partly a house husband. I was doing my work out of the home, financial consulting, uh, I'd written and marketed some products and so forth. And uh, once you kids were off and away, your brother said, hey, Dad, uh, you don't have us to get up and get dressed and off to school every day. Uh, why don't you become a fitness trainer and give you a free gym membership? And I thought, hey, that kind of makes sense. Uh, and I've been doing this for something like two decades. And what's amazing is in my late 70s, I get up in the mornings without much thinking about it. And I do a couple sets of chin-ups and a couple sets of push-ups, alternating between them and so forth. Uh, sometimes I climb the stairs in our building. And uh, I've done as many two as 200 flights of stairs at a go, but more commonly 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 flights of stairs. Yeah. And amazingly, I feel great. Uh, I went for my annual physical and the lady was putting, had me lay down on the bench and putting electrodes on my chest, giving me a, a test for my heart. heart. And she said, uh, how old do you feel? I said, maybe in my 40s. Uh, <laughs> I'm pushing 80 years old. Uh, I feel better than I have in three or four decades. And in the meantime, all of my contemporaries are busy popping pills and taking 8, 10, 12, 15 different prescriptions per day. Um, some years ago, I had my thyroid gland taken out. It, I don't think it was cancerous, but it was, had grown uh, in size and was kicking out too much thyroid. Uh, so the only th medication I take is just a replacement for the thyroid that was removed. I take some vitamins and minerals and things like that, and I go for the highest quality supplements I can take. But I don't need all these things that other people need. and. I attribute a lot of that just to the fact that I get my exercise. And what's kind of interesting, uh, I was working with one of my fitness clients. Uh, it was a gym in his building and a young guy about at the time about 19 years old. And we set up some cable weights and so on. And I started working on them and so on. I, or I demonstrated some chin-ups and so forth. To have a guy pushing 80 years old jump up and do some chin-ups. And I could do them more easily than he could. And he was a teenager. Uh, I have a guy that's been working out at a gym for some years and, uh, you know, I can pull more weight than he can and I don't have all these bulging muscles and so forth. Um, I've 
never taken steroids or hormones or any of those things. Uh, I grew up in an interesting time when people used their bodies. Uh, although we had farmland, uh, we generally arranged to have other people come and you know, use their equipment. Around. I would drive a tractor with a plow or do certain things, but overall we'd have others come in and then we'd share the proceeds from selling the crop. But my cousins would uh, you know, bale hay and so forth, and you'd have in those days a separate hay baling uh, machine pulled behind a tractor, and it would kick out every periodically. It would take in the, you know, the whatever it was baling, and then kick out hay bales at the rear end. And alongside of it, or right behind it, would be another tractor pulling what they called a flatbed. It was a flat, flatbed trailer. You'd have three or four guys on there, and they'd be stacking hay bales. And one guy would jump down on the ground, be walking along, and he'd pick up hay bales with a wire or binding twine that had it. He'd pick it up, and you do your lifting by your legs. If you did it with your upper body, you'd, you'd be sore in a hurry. Uh, so knowing how to do these things was second nature. He'd throw the bale up on the flatbed trailer, and guys would stack it, and we'd work like that all, you know, through the day. Yeah. Uh, we worked too long and too hard uh, that our muscles were truly sore. And if you were putting up hay or harvesting a crop, you worked and worked and worked really too much for optimum building your body up. But people, people were strong in those days, and they had endurance, and they could do what they needed to do. And fast forward that. Oh, and then another thing uh, down on the co-op grain elevator. Um, they had, uh, it was right along the railroad tracks, and they'd sell sacks of fertilizer. And sometimes on a Saturday morning, if we wanted to make some extra money, the kids would go down there, and some workman would be unloading the you know, sacks of fertilizer. He'd pick one up, throw it over his shoulder, walk out, put it on the, uh, on the dock, loading dock, and he'd go back and get another one. They didn't have all the fancy equipment we had and pallets and all that in those days. So he'd tip us some money and it didn't take a whole lot of money to make us happy that we could go buy a candy bar or a soda or something like that and uh, we'd peter out after a pretty short time half an hour an hour and a half you know we just wouldn't last because we were kids but he'd take pity on us give us some money and we were thrilled that we could go buy you know some candy or, or something um, so growing up in that era we never had a gym i hadn't even heard of or seen a gym uh, for decades after that so people go to the gym and they get on these machines and they're busy, busy you know, complaining that they can't get all the right channels on TV or they're sitting on something barely pedaling and flipping through the pages on a magazine or listening to their music and spending all their time and effort dialing for the different songs. And they wonder why in the world are they not getting any result? Uh, and the machines usually set on one, you know, when it will go dial up effort from one to 20 and they have it on one and they don't realize or care as long as they're sitting sitting there and it's in the ambience of a gym, they think they should get some kind of magical benefit from it. Um, yeah. It doesn't, I mean, with the shutdown from the coronavirus, uh, I'm largely confined to my apartment. The gym in the big apartment building I live in is effectively closed, and yet there, I have a chinning bar from when you kids were young, and I chin myself using the chinning bar in a doorway. Uh, I do push-ups, uh, which I can easily enough do, uh, some stair climbing and so forth. And everything in, in a gym is basically pushing, pulling, or squatting while using an engaged uh, core the, in the midsection of your body, just tightening it up to keep your body stable. And uh, pushing would be ex an example of pushing a farm wagon, or pushing downward to climb over a fence, or pushing upward to push a package up onto a shelf. Right. Or pulling would be like hoisting a sail, uh, rowing a boat, pulling your arms toward you, or lifting you know, a couple buckets on the farm, one bucket in each hand. And then squatting, you squat to pick up firewood or squat to pick up a baby. And these are functions that our body was just designed to do. Uh, and the equipment in the gym looks really nifty, uh, but you don't really need it. Um, doing the pull-ups sort of requires an upper butt, you know, something you can grab onto. Out in the wilderness, you can grab a tree limb about the right height and pull yourself up and down and do it slowly. Some people do these things in jackrabbit quick things, uh, but slowing it down, uh, speed is a function of making something harder. So if you have a weight that's a little bit too light, if you lift it more slowly, uh, ideally, you know, the, with the right weight, you'd uh, do a bicep curl, you'd be bending the weight upward, 1,001, 1,002, and then bringing it down maybe at a little bit slower rate uh, with three or four seconds going down. Because as your muscle is lengthening, it's stronger than it is when it's shortening. So uh, you can take a little bit more time as the muscle is lengthening. Uh, but some people just do jackrabbit uh, things on chin-ups or they do a short range of motion and you really want to work your muscles pretty much over the full well, range and then, of motion. And then also people, also people will, will do heavier weights than they really ought to and they'll kind of throw their whole body into it just to sort of uh, 
and and you don't really exactly risk hurting good, yourself, good and you don't and you don't get a lot of benefit out of that. And uh, you have to have to listen to your body. And people wonder why are there mirrors in a gym? Well, it isn't for ego, so everybody can admire their bodies. It's so that you can watch yourself and and observe. Ideally, if you have a workout buddy, or better yet. If you try a fitness trainer uh, for a few times, if you can't afford a lot of times, just have the fitness trainer line you out with proper form and then watch in the mirror to make sure that you don't use uh, auxiliary muscles. You want to use the ones you're intending to use. No, that was a very good point. So well, well, you have I, some specific questions for me. Well, I, I know that when I'm working out, um, I do a lot of complex motions that, that uh, you know, I don't, I don't try to isolate one particular muscle because I'm not trying to build, you know, my body. I try to do things more... Uh, functionally, not that I've not that I've been to the gym in a while, but I've got some uh, I've got some concrete bags that uh, <laughs> that were sitting outside for a little too long, and they've turned to solid blocks of concrete. And so sometimes I'll pick them up and I'll move them around the yard. They're about you know about well, they were 80 pound bags of concrete. Now they're probably about 100 you know 110 pounds because they've got all that water soaked in. Uh, and so you know I'll do like a complex oh, you know pick it up and, and and move it around or um, uh, you know, sometimes I've, I've got a pile of wood. I don't have, uh, I've got way too much wood, but, uh, you know, I've got a pile of wood from an old tree that, uh, you know, I'll help, uh, in ice storms, I'll gather up old trees and I'll use my axe and I'll, I'll chop the, uh, chop the wood, things like that. And so I try to, I know when, when I'm, uh, working out, unless I'm trying like power lifting where I really want to bulk up, mostly I'm just trying to do practical exercises that mimic, uh, real life activities. Uh, picking something heavy up off the ground, moving it, putting it down somewhere else, and picking it up and moving it, you know, back. And those those are perfect. You know, that's real world uh, exercise. And, and in fact, oh, go ahead. No, I say, and 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 that tends to use multiple uh, multiple muscle groups. Uh, you know, and and all the because I'm more concerned about building up all those little stabilizer muscles because I'm I'm plenty strong, but you know, I've got I've got a little ding in my shoulder from from a. Uh, you know, I was, I was in a, doing some medieval combat sports, and I shield slammed somebody badly, and I didn't I didn't use good form, and I, I tore my shoulder a little bit, and so those little stabilizer muscles, uh, and you learn all about them in wrestling because you you feel miserable if you don't build up all those stabilizer muscles that help hold your body together, uh, and so I think that in real world activities, more than just like your bicep curls, doing something. You know, actually, like picking and grabbing, where you're using your biceps, you're using your core, you're using your shoulders, and getting everything all together, and you work all these little muscles that help hold everything in place. Uh, I think building those up is more important than building up your major muscle groups, at least from an injury prevention standpoint. Uh, you, know, you want to do multiple things at a time, and in fact, this brings up the issue uh, in days past, you know, half a century or a century ago. Uh, there weren't a whole lot of doctors around. You just go out and start doing things. Uh, in this day and age, before you go to the gym, particularly if you haven't worked out at all in recent times, you want to do check with a doctor, get a clearance, and you know if he tells you, you know, do this or do that, you know, uh, pay attention to what the doctor advises you. But uh, no, it, it, real world activities and listening to your body. So many people try and do too much. They're they're all about the numbers. You know, I could bench press X amount of weight or why amount of weight or whatever. Uh, you want, ideally, to do whatever you do, 8 to 10 to 12 repetitions, maybe 15 or 20 if you underestimated the weight and have to do it a few more times or do it more slowly. But you take it right up to that point where your muscles are sort of trembling. If somebody put a gun to your head and said, do another repetition, you'd say, you might as well pull the trigger. I just can't do anymore. So, you know, you don't, you don't really overdo it. You make your body sufficiently tired it basically, in, in a non-harmful non way, tears the muscle fibers so that they grow back stronger. Just and a uh, anywhere from, go ahead. just a quick thought. We probably uh, shouldn't use uh, use certain analogies like you know put a gun to your head because the uh, the the AIs that help you know monitor all the YouTube and organize things they don't understand nuance very well, and so okay. we don't want to get the video blacklisted because we said naughty <laughs> things that the computer doesn't understand. Uh, just just a uh, just a just a thought. Shall there. we call it a toy gun? Okay. Well, you just, uh, you know, I think I don't think we're going to get in trouble because usually it'll then go to a manual review and then some living person will be like, oh yeah, that's not what they're talking about. I'm but, I'm, I'm in the wrong generation and I'm I'm speaking hypothetically. Yeah. Anyway, so much for that. But, but you yeah, wanna, you want you want to go to the point of failure to where you can't do anymore, 
Tempor temporary muscle right. failure, uh -huh. not an injury. And uh -huh. So what, what, what I've sometimes done, and I don't know if this is good or bad, uh, is when I get to the point where I can't do, you know, one more, if I'm on a machine where I can, you know, flip a flip a pin and drop the weight is that I'll drop the weight by like, you know, 10 pounds. So I can do a couple more and I'll drop the weight a couple so I can get a couple more and try and go through until Perfect. I'm just completely uh -huh. wiped out. But the, the thing that I have to be very careful with, cause I've got, I had some joint problems in high school from wrestling is it's, I find that it's very important to know the difference between muscle burn and, and your joint or bone type, you know, like actual real injury pain. You know, so a muscle soreness is good. That means that your muscles are working, and but you don't want to overdo that. But if you feel uh, a uh, you know like your tendon stretching out or some sort of problem with your with your joints, that you want to you just want to call it a day. I think this this brings us to a, a good thing uh, that nutrition is crucial as well, and you want to put really really high quality foods into your body. Um, if people ate what their great grandparents ate. Uh, it'd be a lot healthier and probably 95 99 percent of the things in the supermarket numerically are just not good for you and if the ingredient list says a whole lot more you know than one or two ingredients you know if it just says beef or uh, you know i don't know sardines water and salt that's pretty safe but when you get all these things you can't pronounce and they love to disguise all these different kinds of sugar yeah the high fructose corn the ingredients, syrup and right and that's the worst uh, but you're, you, there's so many different kinds of sugar, and they're supposed to list the ingredients in order of quantity. So if sugar is a major component in whatever it is, they'll start out with whatever it is, beef broth. I'm, I'm exaggerating, but and then they'll list one kind of sugar, then another kind of sugar, then another kind of sugar, and another kind of sugar. And you think, oh, okay, I have no idea what uh, all these things are, but, it, you know, dextrose, Any of those, sucrose, Yeah, dextrose whatever, and yeah. sucrose, fructose, and all that stuff are, are different sugars. And then you've got high fructose corn syrup, and you think, well, if it's high, it must be pretty good. Um, and that's probably one of the words. Anyway, the more natural the foods, the better, and the more nearly it is what our primitive ancestors ate, the better. Uh, mankind evolved over something like a million years, and only in the last 100 or 200 years have we been eating really, really bad foods. There's a new diet called the ketogenic diet or the caveman diet, uh, and it leans toward even being a carnivore diet. Um, and uh, the thinking is that primitive men, uh, in large part, ate animals. You know, and as I was a kid, you'd go out and shoot rabbits and squirrels down on the farm, or uh, I'd go to your, my mom uh, and say, "Hey, the kids and I are going to go along the railroad tracks. I'll bring back a couple squirrels or rabbits." I'd take a gunny sack, a burlap gunny sack, tuck it up under my belt, and we wear blue jeans. Just tuck that sack under my belt, and whatever you, animals you you did in, you bring them back and skin them and have them for a meal. And primitive man would eat these. I was at the tail end of an era where we still had some hunting skills, but now you know people have gone vegetarian. Um, I guess you could joke and say, well, that the plants cringe when you come and uh, eat them or something. But I, you know, you know, life is what it is. We survived for a million years eating what we did. Uh, there are animals, you know, antelope, uh, buffalo, a deer, whatever it is out in the wild. They graze. They eat all day long. You can't get enough calories eating veggies. Uh, can you imagine trying to have enough calories just eating salads? Uh, we tend to eat uh, tubers and roots and things like this, potatoes. Uh, but the thinking is that our body does better on a low carbohydrate or an almost no carbohydrate diet, more nearly like our primitive ancestors. In fact, the uh, Inuit Eskimos uh, would survive on, on know, whale fish fat. And, yeah, and they they didn't know what a vegetable was, and they were healthier. The the sick ones were the ones that went into town and ate the white man's diet. So, uh, well, wouldn't, anyway, wouldn't it have, the, uh, I would imagine that genetics uh, has something to do with it, depending on where your, where, where good, your bloodline yeah. evolved. Um, you know, I would imagine that if I were, uh, if I were up there in, uh, eating nothing but fish and fat, that might make me a little bit, uh, sick because I'm not, you know, cause my ancestors, well, your, your body, your microbes, not used to it, your perhaps. microbes would deal with it. Uh, I found I've been switching over more recently, uh, to eating fish and you know natural you know more of a carnivore diet and you know your your gut bacteria it takes a little while to switch over but uh, you know you and I come from a northern European background where there wasn't much sun sunshine and 
from a survival standpoint, our skin, you know, over generations got lighter and lighter to absorb vitamin D from the sun. But you didn't, you, it wasn't like a supermarket now where you could go in and have fruits and veggies uh, 24-7. Uh, you know, fruits, even as I was growing up as a kid in the Midwest, uh, you'd have a season of a week or two and you'd have some fruits and that was it. Um, you know, berries. Right, because you know, they, didn't, they didn't have the means to store them long term or freeze them. Because when you go no, to when you go to or Walmart the, or and you the buy transportation. A, yeah, when you go to Walmart and you buy an apple, uh, you know, in in the middle of winter, it's because that apple's probably been frozen somewhere, and uh, or being hauled from halfway around the world where it's apple season, uh, in mm-hmm. the southern hemisphere, and and yeah, that wasn't now, possible till recently. Now people from a uh, you know diet clo- you know eating foods closer to the equator, uh, would you know maybe have gone toward you know they just reach up and grab some fruit off a tree. But uh, overall, certainly uh, a lot of Americans, particularly Northern European background, uh, would do better on, a, on probably more of a caveman type diet that their, their ancestors would have eaten. So anyway, much of our health, our fitness, our well-being, uh, even old age is a function of, you know, our exercise and nutrition. And uh, we look at people, we just think it's natural that people are bedridden in their older years. You want to do what, what uh, your health span and your lifespan are come out about the same. You don't want to spend 10 years laying in bed, you know, with bed sores and having a, a tough life just because you thought your life was bulletproof when you were young and ate all the wrong foods. You know, you know what so, I found, speaking of food, you know what I found interesting is uh, in, in my travels, uh, when I've been to uh, some of the Eastern European countries where I don't think they know where pro- what processed food is, it's all, you know, you, a lot of the stuff is just by default. It's organic food. They don't put a lot of, you know, weird stuff uh, in, their, in their produce. And you get some amazing produce. It's all basically organic because that's just how they've been doing it forever. And mm-hmm. whereas if you go to some of the wealthier countries where they've got all these artificial systems for producing things, you've got to either pay extra to get organic food uh, or, or, uh, or you get crap. And what I found is that in some of these places, just regular straight from the farm, uh, you know, just straight from the village farm to your table, uh, you know, you know, regular produce, regular food, frankly, tastes better and looks better than some of the organic stuff you get here. Uh, you pay a lot of money for here in America. And, and I always thought that was kind of interesting. I was in I was in Greece uh, and we were eating some fish. And we basically bought the fish straight from the fisherman who caught it right out of the ocean and was just selling it off the side of his uh, of his boat uh, at at the dock, and it was that was really good fish. You know, we've we've gotten away from these healthy foods, and the foods are the building blocks of our bodies. We we have to, and if it costs a little bit more to eat healthier foods, uh, if you if you had to choose a car and make it last, you know, like fifty or seventy years, uh, you'd take awfully good care of the car. And yet people, you know, young people particularly think, oh, my body's bulletproof. Uh, you know, it's like taking a, a car brand new and, you know, racing at ridiculous speeds and taking around corners fast and over harsh bumps. We want to take care of our bodies. And uh, people tend to think, oh, you know, I'm bulletproof. I can go out and abuse my body with all sorts of drugs, alcohol, smoking, you name it. And uh, it well, doesn't show up then and there, but it shows out up down the line. I, I'm sure that, you know, I've, I've noticed that... Uh with a lot of, you know, compared to a lot of my college friends, just the fact that I never smoked and I don't drink very much and I've never done drugs. Um, I, you know, I've got some friends who did all of the above in abundance and you look at them now and maybe they're even five years younger than me and they look, they look, they look older than you. I mean, they're all wrinkled and just, you know, just, just, you know, practically zombies falling apart uh, because they, they partied too hard in college. And, and I find that because I've always taken, you know, relatively good care of myself, not, not perfect, but, you know, good enough, uh, I find that, uh, you know, I don't, have, I don't have any health problems or any of the things that a lot of my, uh, a lot of my, a lot of my college friends uh, seem to be dealing with these days. You know, a lot of them are on high blood pressure medication, and some of them are diabetic, and, and, and like I said, some of them are missing teeth from the drugs they did, or... or uh, you know, or all the cigarettes they smoked, or whatever, and and I think people uh, people don't realize that your body is an investment, and 
it's your your body's probably the greatest investment you know your body and your mind and i consider the two to be you know one entity because your your physical health affects your mind and your mental health affects your your body but uh that's really your biggest investment in life is your body you only get one of them at least right now you i do. have a thought for you okay uh one of my clients who's older than i am uh this trainer was out of town and uh i worked with him um He's, he always just about anything you want to analyze, and he made a lot of money out in the real world uh, doing things. Said, follow the money, and anything you do, you follow the money. When you look at the foods for sale in the supermarkets, sugar's cheap, and uh, they they stuff it with sugar, everything with sugar, and it's addictive, and uh, all these sugary foods. And the foods that are healthier are at a clear clear back and peripheral part of your supermarket. You have to pass all the wrong foods even to get to the ones that you'd have any business eating. And then you take certain things. I was looking at uh, salt, and Morton salt, and if I recall, has sugar in it. Why in the world would you want sugar in salt? Now, there are other brands. I may, maybe I, I'm mistaken on that, but why in the world would you want sugar in salt? When it comes to that, uh, and you know, you go on some of these prepared meats that are pre-cooked and so forth, you read the ingredient list, and, and sugar's in it. Right, because sugar's, because sugar's addictive. Yeah, yeah, and it makes everything seemingly taste better, even though the long-term effects are negative. Um, you wouldn't buy a house or a car without reading the contract, or at least you wouldn't have any business doing that, or certainly have a lawyer look it over. Yeah. And yet, people look at the front of the food package and all has all you know new, improved, and terrific, and all that. And you turn over in the part you almost can't read buried on the side of the box in itty bitty print. You can hardly see on a gray background with any itty bitty skinny print you'll see all you know the 26 ingredients in the thing and if it has more than a certain number of ingredients or a lot of them that you have no idea what they are you have no business with that particular product so uh, follow the money yeah and the same thing you know the food industry makes us sick and then uh, we go to the doctor and the doctor gets an awful lot of his education by way of the pharmacy uh, or pharmaceutical reps that come around and say oh I've got this new wonder drug and this and that if you take any of these drugs and read the insert this in the package you know, it tells you, well, you know, it may cause headaches, a diarrhea, you know, stomach cramps, you know, and, and worse. And nobody pays any attention to this. So you take another drug to deal with the ba bad effects of the first drug. Before you know it, you're taking half a dozen or a dozen drugs. And uh, maybe in the first place, maybe you could kind of get by. Maybe if you got a little more sleep, uh, if you ate better nutrition and so forth, stress relief. If you can't do something about a particular issue, there's no point even worrying about it. Uh, you just do the best you can and stop worrying about it. Yeah. So, uh, and then you want to outsmart yourself to wear exercise. Uh, you know, you have a gym bag a short distance from where you are. What was about 15, 20 feet away yeah, from it's just, you? It's just right over, yeah, it's just right over there. Um, yeah, I have, a, I have a little gym set up. Uh, so, um, I've, I've, you know, I'm, I'm, in my, I'm in my server building, you know, essentially my... Uh, my home office server building where I have all my internet and all my all my technology and then I've set up a, a studio here and since I spend a lot of my time inside in the studio then j just right off to the side uh, I've got a little uh, little gym set up with uh, suspension trainers you know cables and and a heavy punching bag and electrical trainer machine and you know if I'm doing a big data copy I'll hop on the electrical trainer for 15 minutes while the while the data's copying, or I'll do some some exercises while I'm waiting, or I'll just take a break, get up and take a break every 15, 20 minutes, uh, because I don't like to sit for too long because my knees get sore. Or I'll I'll work on the on the on the heavy punching bag for a little bit, and and so yeah, I make it really convenient to work out, and that that gives me, it, it's just sort of a no-brainer for me to work out for five, ten minutes at a time when I'm getting up to do something, or when I just want to take a quick break. So you, basically, you want to make things convenient. Uh, the doorway to the room in, in our apartment building that I'm in has a chinning bar in it, and I, I walk under it. And I, I look up and I say, you know, I could chin myself a few yeah, times. Yeah, that's that my old, do a set. You know, our old bedroom. Yeah, my brother and my my yeah. bedroom. Yeah, we put it up there because every time, every time Paul and I would go in and out of the room, we'd do a couple chin ups, and and when you get through the day, you've done you know ten, twenty, thirty chin ups, you know, a few at a time, just as many as you could do. Paul do a lot more than me because he's really good at chin-ups and I wasn't, but, uh... Well, but there's you, your key. To take it as many as you can, you know, right up to temporary muscle fatigue. Yeah. So, yeah, so you definitely want to ideally, multiple easy. sets. Yeah, you just want to, you want to make it easy and convenient to, uh, to work out. And, 
you know, and, and gyms are nice. Like when I when I I don't I don't go to the gym, you know, so much right now, uh, but formally. Yeah. Well, no. I. I mean, there's there's. Uh, I mean, you, you, there's a gym that you you do go to, but you know that involves you know, right. getting there and getting back. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I. I've. I've set up a home workout area because of all the virus stuff, but you know, in the in the past, uh, you know, I don't. I, you know, I'll go to the gym if I'm going to do some very serious focused weightlifting and whatnot. But if I'm going to do, you know, cardio or 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 lighter exercise, I'll just do it in my home gym because it's, it's easy. Now, not everybody has. Uh, the space to build a uh, to build a home gym, but even uh, even growing up in in New York in that cramped apartment, uh, or or when I when I'm traveling and I'm in a hotel room, uh, you know you can set up different chairs or or you do push ups on the floor and you can do uh, you can do you can do different things. You just make do with what you've got. And the the important part I think is is the consistency, because at least at least my thoughts are when you're when you're when you're exercising. It's not just a physical activity, but it's also a mental activity to to train your brain to to be very focused and and work. And I found that when I was in college, the uh, the the discipline and and habits from working out in high school translated well to studying. Uh, in uh, you know studying for exams or trying to learn learn material, you just you just go through and you systematically do it. Just like when you go to the gym, you systematically go through your through your training routine at least i found i found that to be a parallel let me address one other issue and uh you know you mentioned that you're younger age to me a very young age compared to me um you know whether it's shoulder issues or knee issues or whatever um almost everybody by the time they reach one third of the way through their life or longer starts encountering some various issues the shoulder joint is a rotator that's very fragile you know compared to your hip joint the the ball joint doesn't set in near, nearly as well. And by older age, uh, almost everybody has one or both shoulders kind of injured. And it basically you've torn or stretched out some connective tissue. And what you find is just by being conservative and not overdoing it, uh, a lot of times this will heal back to a certain extent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, and then uh, people c- often complain of back pain. And the first thing the doctor does is prescribe something to deaden the pain. Uh, but that's often a result of not using their back muscles, having strong stabilizing back muscles. Uh, the vertebra and the spine, the components of the spine, are like sewing spools stacked up with little rubber donuts in between them. And as as uh, and you've got uh, like rubber bands holding everything in the spine in place, like your connective tissue and muscles. If these muscle uh, rubber bands stretch out, uh, then all of a sudden the um, vertebra and the spine are not stable and you get pinching of these uh, donuts in between the, the vertebra. And then nerve t- nerves uh, radiate out at various levels in the body, usually in the lower back or in the neck area. It's where people get uh, pain. And uh, by doing appropriate exercise, you know, people that would do their rowing or uh, pulling a sail, hoisting a sail, or doing things like this, strengthen the back muscles. And all we do mostly in this day and age is just sit hunched over a chair, uh, hunched toward a computer screen. So we're stretching out the back muscles and getting them flaccid and weak and tightening all the stomach muscles. So what we need to a certain extent is just the reverse as if you were rowing a boat. In fact, there's a machine uh, in the gym called a concept rowing machine that people can row at. Or you sit on a bench and you can pull uh, handles and, and you know their weight stacks and so forth you can work. Uh, or you could lay face down on a bench and you could, you could uh, lift a, a dumbbell in each hand and you know to the side of the bench and lift that. So without strengthening those uh, back muscles, sure, you're going to have all kinds of pain. But just taking a pill for it isn't, isn't going to solve the problem. Well, and then also, speaking of being hunched over at a, at a computer, um, you know, I like to try and sit back a ways from my, you know, from, my, from my computer screen. I find that by having a larger screen, and I can sit back, and I can sit in good posture. Because you know, I don't want to be all hunched over like this, you know, just doing my, doing my thing that's going to ruin my back but if i can sit in no good the shoulders shoulders back the chin tucked back that that's exactly what you're right. going for and then and then the other thing i do is i try not to sit for more than about 15 30 minutes even if it's just to get up walk around the house stretch go outside play with the dog for a minute just to get up keep my you know work my shoulders you know especially this one because that's the one that i that's my shield shoulder that one's that one's the one that that's a little bit weird uh but yeah you know good just maintaining good posture is uh 
I think is part of having a, a solid back. I mean, I have a really solid back, and maybe that's just from all the wrestling training. And we did a lot of back exercises and a lot of, you know, a lot of other stuff. You don't you don't have any back pain or neck pain or any of those, I, I presume. No, no, no. I mean, I hurt my back once, but, uh, uh, you know, I think maybe four years ago, I slept funny, and I just woke up with a terrible cramp in my back, and that just sucked for a week. But you know, other other than that, yeah, that sounds like a muscle spasm. Yeah. yeah. Other other than that, it's just not it's not really a big not really big deal because I try to. But you know, but then again, I also I also work out a little bit every day. I don't you know I don't I don't do it like I did in college, but uh, you know I try back, to. Back to your original video that when your body is fit, when your body is strong, it you know it helps with your mental state. You can solve problems. You can do things. There's a story in high school, a uh, young kid, not particularly big, uh, but he you know, grew up on a farm. He was you know, active doing farm chores all the time and so forth. There was a particular curve about a mile, mile and a half out of town, and uh, cars would tend to go around it, sometimes misjudge the speed. It was a gravel, gravel road, and uh, they had, I think, an old Chevrolet, and he and his mom were traveling in it, and for whatever reason, the car flipped and people didn't wear seat belts in those days. It was probably in the yeah, probably in the 1950s. And uh, the mom went through the windshield outside the car. The car rolled and pinned her down. Now, you know whether I don't recall whether she had a broken leg or she was just pinned or whatever. This kid was so filled with adrenaline. He had bulging muscles. I mean, not ridiculous like the guys taking steroids now, but he looked very fit and not a particularly tall guy. You know, five feet seven, five feet eight. Uh, maybe five feet ten. I don't. I don't think it was even that. But anyway, in those days, cars had metal bumpers on them, and he was so filled with adrenaline. And a car in those days probably weighed two, two and a half thousand pounds. He literally lifted one corner of the car, lifting I don't know equivalent of three, four, five hundred pounds, and his mother was able to squirm out from under the car. Yeah. And then later, of course, somebody came along and took him to the hospital. But the fact that he had that kind of strength. Uh, you know, fired up with adrenaline. He was he was strong. He was physically strong, and that just came from doing farm chores. You know, lifting hay bales. You'd get out and you'd feed the cattle every day, uh, with the hay that you'd harvested in the summertime, and uh, have it in the barn and throw throw the hay bales out to the cattle in the wintertime. Yeah, I've do, I've done some pretty strong lifting, um, on dares, but I don't. I try not to do that because if I lift anything too heavy, I find, I find that my muscles are stronger than my joints. And and I don't mm -hmm. know if that's common or if that's just a me thing, but I know that there was a in college there's a there's this rack of Tibetan gongs and uh, and uh, on a dare, uh, they 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 dared me to try and pick it up because I was very strong and so I hooked my arms underneath it and I you know I lifted it up like half an inch off the ground just enough to kind of jingle it, and that right there you know put my back and my knees and everything just in tremendous pain, and so I don't I don't try to lift anything that heavy you know anything more than. A couple hundred pounds, and I'm, I'm not going to touch it. Part part of wisdom is dialing back as you get older. That what you can do at age 20 is not something you should be doing at 30, 40, 50, 60 years old. And you get these people that think they're you know youth, youthful athletes, and they're in their 60s or 70s. Uh, I watch people. There, there's a running shop that sells sneakers and all sorts of running gear uh, here in New York City, well, six or eight blocks from our house. And I go in there and I see these people limping in and hobbling in and they say, you know, I've got a marathon and I've got this and I've got a, you know, do you have a special insert or something? No, dummy. <laughs> stop, stop banging your, your joints with, with all that. You take a 200 pound man and your knee joint is something about the size of, you know, not, not much bigger than a quarter. And it's like a, a piece of Teflon, kind of squishy or spongy. And, you know, it'll take an impact once or twice. You can, if you're going to run a, a 10k or something like that and pound your body and when you're running your body weight that 200 pound body weight triples or quadruples so instead of pounding that little bit of area on each each knee uh, you know with 200 pounds you're pounding it with 600 pounds or 800 pounds repeatedly time after time after and then people wonder why in the world do i have to have a knee operation right, right. well and if and you look at these marathon runners like the actual professional olympic marathon runners they're really lightweight skinny people yeah um, well, and even even then, they often get ankle problems. Yeah. They say, "Well, primitive primitive man ran." Well, maybe you can get you know some videos of Maasai warriors in Africa loping along on you know grass grass plains in Africa, 
they were just trying to cover some territory, um, but they weren't landing hard on their feet on asphalt or concrete. And if you can't run and catch a mouse, who's who, what primitive man is going to run down a major sized animal? Yeah, he used his brain. You know, you'd make traps or snares or, you know, gang up to run some animals off a cliff or whatever you do, but you wouldn't run the darn animal down. Uh, we weren't designed primarily as running creatures. We can run, but these people get the runners high and this and that doesn't strike me as a particularly good way to use your body if you want your my, body to functional in your my, old age. My, my understanding, and, and I could be wrong on this, I remember there's there's an old guy that told me once that over short distances the horse is going to win, but over long distances you know, uh, a, a human can walk rapidly and the horse will eventually get, uh, you know, the horse would eventually get tired. You know, a horse has the advantage if you're carrying lots and lots of weight, but if you're just, you know, unencumbered, uh, you know, people can, can just go for, you know, 20, 30, 40 miles, you know, straight if they're in good shape. And, and I think that some of these, uh, you know, some of the, some of the, the primitive man would, uh, would probably, uh, not just use their brain, but also, you know, pace themselves. You know, I know that if I'm pacing myself, I can go tremendous distance. Well, if, if you had a wounded animal, let's say you throw a spear, or sometimes right. I, in, in, in the days I was a kid growing up and you were hunting, and, you know, an animal, you know, would be wounded, and you'd want to put a second shot in it to put it out of its discomfort, uh, you'd generally try for a body shot, uh, you know, that wouldn't necessarily do it in, in one shot. But, you know, you couldn't necessarily keep up with it, but you'd follow and follow and then catch up with it. Right, right. But uh, I don't think I'd try and outrun a horse. Um, you and I would backpack in the Rocky Mountains, and we'd cover 8, 10, 12, 15 miles in a day sometimes. Um, uh, but we would go at a regular pace, and we'd be carrying, of course, our backpacks and so forth. Yeah. Well, and in, in some of the hiking that I've done, you know, around here, this is flatter terrain in Oklahoma, but I've gone gone on you know twenty twenty five mile uh, hikes, but it's flat, and so that makes it that makes it really easy. Uh, and I wasn't carrying a big backpack; I was just carrying a small day pack. You know, we were we were in the mountains, and the rock is between a mile and a half and uh, between two and three miles above sea level, and the air is thin up there, and, and carrying uh, a fair amount of weight. Yeah. Well, what 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 topics have we not covered? I think well, the 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 big over. the big thing that I was trying to get at in the video, or or, or the part that I was leading to was that as you build up your physical strength and you have a healthy lifestyle this gives you uh this this tends to give you more energy uh and 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 as you have more energy you can accomplish more a lot of my accomplishments in life that i've done personally uh you know i don't claim to be a, a genius or or particularly skilled at anything but i've got the energy to just focus and, and work and work and work and and get the thing done you know, I'm I'm not dumb, obviously, but uh, if you've got the energy to really pursue something difficult and and see it to completion, you're more likely to accomplish it. And and I find that my physical strength and stamina give me the energy which helps me be successful in life. And and that was that was sort of why I wanted to you know, and I start as I start my series of videos talking about how to become you know, independently successful and how to live a free and independent lifestyle. Uh, it, it seems to me that your physical body is really the foundation of all other accomplishments because if you don't have the means to control your own physical environment, then, then how are you going to, how are you going to do anything? How are you going to do anything else? And so, no, that's a good comment. And, and so what I what I found also is when I'm dealing with other people, uh, you know, having a list of you know ha having the energy, having a list of accomplishments helps, but also being, you know, physically uh, solid, especially in a hostile situation. Uh, you know, sometimes in business negotiations, people can get really you know really agitated, really aggressive, and just start really trying to trying to intimidate you. And and I remember there was a uh, I was in a uh, in a negotiation with a uh, with a rather portly gentleman, shall we say? I think that's a nice way to to put it. And um, you know he uh, was trying to get all you know all 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 in my in my face, just really trying to get me to agree to something that I didn't want to agree to. And and I thought to myself, 
Man, you look like you're gonna have a heart attack. I could... You're not gonna kick my ass. All I have to do is just hold my ground and say, no, the terms are, I'm gonna do these things, and you're gonna have to pay me this much, and I just held my ground calmly and confidently, and eventually he capitulated. But I thought it was interesting how sometimes people... And, and it's not the only situation where people have tried to use their physical size to, uh, to, uh, to sort of muscle in on, on, a, on a negotiation. But if you have the, the physical strength and physical prowess that you know that you're in good health and, you're, and that you're solid and you can at least not embarrass yourself if, uh, if some, some trouble starts, then that gives you a certain calm that you can that you can use to your advantage in a negotiation or in a business situation or even in a life confrontation you know there's uh you know i was i was on the street once and this really scrawny guy uh, i don't know if he's hyped up on drugs or whatever but he came up to me and just he was mad and he just came up to me and punched me right in the shoulder and i was like what the hell do you do punching somebody in the shoulder that's not where you punch somebody and and because you know, even though he was taller than me and, 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 but he was so skinny, I probably had, you know, 50, 60 pounds. I mean, I was like 220 pounds and, and he was probably, you know, 160 at best. And, and I knew he, he just didn't have the, he didn't have the strength to hurt me. It was like, I don't know why you're so upset. There's lots of witnesses around. I mean, feel free to keep punching me and eventually you'll go to jail. Uh, what, what am I, you know, what do you want me to, what do you want me to do? And he just wanted to cuss and scream and get, you know, get out of the system. But, you know, had I not been strong and confident and tough from all the years of doing all the stuff that I've done, you know, then, then, you know, I would have been much more likely to be intimidated. But just all the physical hardships that you put yourself through, uh, you know, the hailstorm at, at Philmont or... Um, just getting the crap beat out of me and wrestling all those years or just all those. What all about mixing concrete to put, you know, you know, things, you know, do work around the house. Yeah. Yeah. Mixing yeah. concrete, carrying all those concrete bags by hand. Or when I poured the foundation to this, to this building, I had to move like 60,000 pounds of sand to, to set, uh, the groundwork and dig all the dirt and all the, you know, I mean, just doing all that by hand, which I was too cheap to run a bulldozer, I guess. Um, and, well, and I figured this got, way I didn't have to, some good yeah, I figured this way I don't have to go to the gym that week. I'll just, I'll just do it. Right. And I do it in my spare time. And, uh, plus I didn't want to tear down my fence to get a bulldozer back here, but you know, just all that physical hardship, you know, when some guy throws a half ass punch at you, you're like, eh, it's not worth the trouble. And, and having that kind of confidence from going through physical hardships, you know, chopping wood, digging, digging trenches, um, you know, physical activity, or just going to the gym and just really pushing yourself. Did day I ever after tell you one one thing with with your mom? Uh, one of our earliest, we no no more than been dating. I said very short time, and she was living in a house, a rental house near the edge of the university campus, and she and her female roommate were on the first floor, and then there's there's an outside stairway, and I guess some guys lived on an upper floor. And she called me up and said, "I've got a problem. Uh, the plumber needs to come and fix the sewer." but somebody needs to dig out the sewer. And she said, do you know anybody that could dig out the sewer? And I said, sure, I can. Uh, so I went over there and uh, she somehow came up with a shovel and I dug out the sewer line. And, uh, you know, like you say, if you look fit and capable, yeah. uh, you know, no different than any of the farm work had ever done, uh, digging out a sewer line, maybe had a part in uh, your being <laughs> in well, I'm, existence. I'm, I'm really glad you dug out mom's sewer line then, if that's what helped bring me into existence. So, but and, no, you're, uh, you're, you're right. I was, I had to dig it. I had to dig a ditch, uh, when we were adding power to the building so that I could run all this equipment, you know, when I was building the server building, I need to add a bunch of, a bunch of electricity to here. And we had to go dig a, uh, dig a trench for the electrician. And it was going to save a couple thousand dollars if we did it ourselves. So I called up one of my farm buddies, you know, there's a, you know, living in Oklahoma, there's a lot of farmers around. One of my buddies lives on a farm. And I was like, hey, you want to come over and help me dig a ditch? I'll, I'll buy you lunch. And, uh, and uh, you know, he came over with his shovels, and I had my shovels. We just powered through it. It took us, you know, it took us all day. So I ended up uh, doing more than just getting him lunch. But, you know, we, we, we knocked it out. And I called the, uh, called the guy back, uh, the electrician back, said, okay, it's done. Uh, he, didn't, he, he was surprised we got it done that fast. Uh, but, you know, we just, we just powered through it and did it. 
and and we didn't and, and we did it at a steady pace so we didn't exert ourselves you know o overly isn't it, isn't it nice having a self confidence that you can solve things and do things yeah. that require physical effort well and and and, uh, and and you're not dependent on people the way that you would be if you were I don't, I don't want i don't want to use the word wimp because i think wimp is more of a mental state than a physical state i know very small and and petite people who are who are certainly you know ferocious you know mom mom was very tiny and and she was certainly not a wimp but uh you know having having the you know like i said i think physical strength and mental strength kind of go hand in hand and having the having the confidence that you don't mind a little bit of discomfort and you can get through uh these situations just through just i remember with force. your mom when we were early married before you came along and if we had to move a couch or something she'd just grab one end of it and i grabbed the other end and we'd be lifting it and moving it and trying it in different locations it was yeah. just no big deal so it's good to have that capability. Well, what anything else we need to cover? Or are we yeah, that, that actually that actually made a made it you know raised a good point. You don't have to be big to be to be strong. And when I'm using the term strength, I'm not using just like raw. I can bench press 800 pounds. Uh, but I mean you know just being you can be. I've seen you know look at some of these uh, some of these small ballet dancers who weigh you know 95 pounds and they're you know they're solid. Uh, they're very solid uh, athletic people. Um, or look at the, uh, look at the, you know, if you want to look at a tiny guy, look at the, some of these horse jockeys, these racing jockeys, they might be 95, 100, 110 pounds. Um, I had a friend in high school who was a wrestler and he wrestled at a pretty lightweight class. I don't remember what it was, you know, somewhere in the nineties or low hundreds. Uh, and, and he was, you know, very solid for being such a slender guy. And, and so just because you're small, doesn't mean you can't get strong. I'm not. I'm not a really big guy. You know. I'm. You know, like five seven if I'm standing up straight. Five eight if I have big boots on. But you know, realistically, I'm about like five seven. Uh, but you know, through through years of of training, you build up your body, and and I think the big thing is don't expect it to be an overnight thing. You're not going to wake up one day and be like, I'm going to get in shape, and and you're not going to do it in. You're not going to do it in a couple of weeks. You're not going to do it in a couple of months. It's going to, you know, it's a, it's a multi-year uh, effort. And in 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 uh, in one of my earlier videos, I talk about having conviction. You know, you need the conviction and the follow-through to keep doing it day after day after day after day. And and well, what what you have to do is just outsmart yourself and make it sort of a habit. It's yeah. like you with a punching bag that's just 15 feet away from you. Or me walking under a chinning bar and thinking, ah, oh, it's no big deal to reach up and chin myself a few times. Yeah, I've got a uh, I've got a storage loft uh, up above my up above my head. It's not a proper bar, but uh, and I can't chin myself like this because I'll smack my head. But I can do, you know, regular you know regular pull-ups, uh, or I can mm -hmm. do a partly you know part chin. I can get myself off the ground, but I'm not gonna. I don't want to smack my head. But you know, just having looking for ways to exert yourself even just a little bit just to keep your body active and just to get your muscles used to building up uh you know it's just building good habits to build a strong body well, and and walking you know living in a suburban area with a car we, we walk a lot here in new york city and don't have a car but you know people want to park as close as they can in the shopping mall or they're a big shopping mall they want to rush out and hop in the car and drive to the other end of the shopping mall uh you should feel free to do plenty of walking and uh, people don't tend to, tend to do that. Yeah, I usually park on the on the far side, and 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 get the extra walking there and back. I mean, it depends on you know if it's raining and nasty weather out, I'll park closer. But uh, no, you just have to you have to you've got 24 hours in a day. You're gonna you're you're gonna you're gonna end up spending eight hours of those working. I mean, that's most people don't have the choice. And one of the things that I'm that I'm very fortunate uh, for is that because I've started my own businesses. Even though I work hard, I'm, I'm working for myself, and I can kind of pace my work and do it at my at my leisure. And and a lot all not everybody has that. But you know, you're you're going to be working, let's say, eight hours a day. You're going to be sleeping for eight hours a day. You know, ten if you're lucky. The rest of that time, that's your time. You got to figure out what you're going to do with it. There's going to be some travel back and forth uh, to work, unless you're able to work from home. And more and more people are working from home now, and I think that's going to be. I think that's going to be a trend even after 
uh, e even after we uh, we finish dealing with all the the current virus stuff, I think people once they realize that working from home is good, uh, you know, you just cut out a bunch of commute time. You have options, and 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 I think if you find ways in your life to expand your options and 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 look for opportunities to uh to 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 find useful things you know to look for opportunities where you can benefit yourself you know through your health or through other you know through other things you know i'm always looking for a little little uh even if it's just for 2 minutes here 5 minutes there just something i can do to stay active uh, which especially working at a desk all the time that's 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 super important and most people work at desks you know you just got to find one thing ways we to learned when you were a baby you were the first born we had another you know had your brother after you but um, one thing you learn once you have children is you sleep when the children sleep you know yeah. if you're the home caregiver and uh, in my particular niche currently as a fitness trainer if i have clients i have one 6 a.m. in the morning and another one you know, around midday and another one in the evening, you have to catch a morning, mid-morning nap and uh, mid-afternoon nap. You can't manage on uh, four or five hours sleep. You have to catch your naps when you can. And sleeping is just a matter of you just have to lay down and train yourself just to relax. And uh, the counting sheep thing is kind of a joke. I will think sometimes, what would I put in my backpack to lighten it? Uh, you know, if I'm going on a backpacking trek and I want to take five pounds out of it, what, what items don't I need? What... By the time you're figuring out what you're putting in your backpack or not putting in or what's it, you're before you know it, you're, you're all the way asleep. A lot, a lot of it's just meditation. Even so, what what I'll do a lot of times is I've got a uh, I've got a little nap spot, uh, you know, in here and here in my server room also. And I've got I've got you know like a the, these monitors are set up for the set, but behind there I've got a little uh, you know I've got a uh, kind of a comfy chair. And sometimes what I'll do if I'm going to be doing a you know, I'll get a task started. It's going to take a certain amount of time to, to copy or to manipulate the data. I'll just go catch a 5-10 minute cat nap, and it helps. It's not great, but it helps a little bit. But even if it's just a matter of just sitting in Zen and meditation, you know, relaxing your body, lowering your heart rate, and, and, and creating a sense of calm in your world, just little things like that help your physical health as well as your mental health. And, and, uh, but yeah, you, you catch sleep whenever you can. I've got a, I don't have any kids, but I've got a giant dog. And at five in the morning, when he's ready to get let out, he'll just hop in my bed. He'll smack my face and woo, 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 let me out, right? And and you know when you got a hundred and fifty pound dog jumping on you, you wake up pretty quick. And uh, so you know you get up, you let him out, you go back to sleep, and uh, or or you get up and uh, do a few things, go back to bed. I. I read somewhere that in the that in the Middle Ages or in ancient times when people didn't have electricity, you know, they had to rise and sleep with the sunlight with the sun, but sometimes they'd still wake up in the middle of the night, light a candle, do a few things, and then go back to bed. That that people even then would still sometimes do uh do some nocturnal stuff, do some reading or whatnot. Um, you know, by by the fire or or uh, or whatever they had the means to do. I don't know if that's true or not. But I, I read it somewhere. Well, they had candles, so uh, it sounds probable. I'd, I'd, I'd imagine candles were kind of expensive. So it's probably more by by their by their by their hearth, their uh, their mm -hmm. you know their cooking fire, their fireplace. fire, their fireplace. Yeah. Um. But you know, you just uh, there's there's no there's no one size fits all solution for people. You've got to figure people have to figure it out for themselves what's going to work uh, for their life, but. I I think that at least what I've found is is you build a system that you can just do over and over and over again every day and um you know I don't have I don't have 2 hour blocks that I can just go to the gym and work out for 2 hours straight like I used to be able to do but you know if I know that I'm I'm going to I'm done with this business call and I've got half an hour before my next appointment I'll just hop right on the elliptical trainer and I'll just do my thing for about half an hour and uh, and I, I tend to do it on a hard setting at a slower speed, uh, just because my knees don't like going fast, and uh, and I want the extra resistance. Well, you're but getting a lot of extra upper body workout. What what number do you set the trainer on? I usually set to high fifteen problem. or sixteen. Yeah, and I think it maxes out at twenty. At 20 so yeah. you're, you're pretty well up there. And and I and I don't think it's a linear scale. I think that every every number you go up increases by a larger amount. 
because the mm -hmm. difference between 16 and 20 is a, is a greater distance uh, is a greater difference between 1 and and, and 16 uh, mm -hmm. so but uh, you know you just you just find a system that works and you be consistent about it and then over uh, over a long period of time you're gonna see your health improve and and your various uh, physical attributes uh, improve as well so have we covered pretty much uh, what we want to, or can I, we think I, of I, th else? I think so. I'm not uh, unless you have any other pearls of wisdom to toss in. Uh, well, I'll throw in something kind of semi unrelated. Okay. Um, you know, part of mental relaxation and not having mental stress is avoiding toxic people. And we look around in life, and um, you know, sometimes people can enter into our lives and be demanding and harsh and difficult, and uh, you sort of want to. I mean, your mom and I sort of started out as friends, and it, it worked out very well. Um, you know, you want uh, you know a good relationship with the people that are close to you, and I was I was lucky in that respect. You, you know what I, so, what um, I what I find that's nice about a lot of this working from home stuff is that a lot of the toxic people uh, in my life o over the years have just sort of fallen by the wayside, but. Um, you know, it's hard to. They're busy being toxic with somebody they're, else. They're, I guess. they're they're busy they're busy being stuck at home too, and so they uh, they don't they don't have the means to come out and bother me so much. But uh, no, I think that. And 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 I'll probably do another video on uh, you know on mental health and 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 being you know achieving the right state of mind, because like like I said, I think this is all connected. Your your uh, your physical health, your your let's call it your intellectual, you know, brain power health, and then your more, uh, I don't, I don't want to say spiritual health, but that's kind of, you know, your, your conscience, your, your, your calm, your, because I think that when you talk about mental health, there's really two aspects of it. There's your ability to think logically and solve problems and do stuff, and then there's your peace, your calm, your purpose, your focus, and, and I think those two are maybe a little different, uh, but that might just be how I conceptualize it, because I'm not, I'm not a psychologist or anything. Um, uh, be interesting to ask a psychologist. I wonder if I know any psychologists who I could get on here. I think I might have some customers who are, but uh, but no, I th I think just uh, yeah, getting toxic people out of your life, just like getting toxic food out of your life and toxic activities out of your life. You know, you're you only have the one body, and uh, you can you can uh, there can be a debate over what happens after you die. Do you come back? Do you? have some afterlife or whatnot but this is the life that we know we have and you want to take as good care of yourself as as you can well again again you don't want your body to be falling apart and have all sorts of issues and still have another 5 10 15 years to live or, 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 more, or more than more than that even i know people who are falling apart in their in their 30s and 40s i don't know if they're gonna you know i know somebody who started falling apart in, in her 30s and i don't know I don't know how long she's going to live, but, you know, life's been very difficult for her. I know a couple people like that, actually. So, Well, good lifestyle, and to, to a cer certain extent, you can reverse problems. You know, if, if you've had a bad lifestyle, I think it reverses some with healthy exercise and lifestyle, but better not to have the problems in the first place. Just, you know, from the, from the get-go, just start out with a good, good lifestyle, good it's nutrition, it's certainly, good exercise. It's certainly easier to never... It's certainly easier to never start smoking than it is to quit, you know, once you've been smoking for a while. You know, it's certainly easier to avoid a bad habit than to, to get rid of one after the fact. And, yeah. uh, and I think that probably applies to most, to most aspects in life. Well, I, I had the good fortune. My parents had a healthy lifestyle. They didn't drink. They didn't smoke. Uh, it was an intact marriage until they both died. Um, I had that relationship with your mom. You know, it leads to, you know, offspring... I didn't know, you know, I went away to college. I didn't know that you were supposed to drink and smoke and carouse and do all these things. Uh, so I didn't. Uh, and you went off to college and pretty much the same for you. Well, you I, know, was, I, you was, just... I was pretty fortunate in that beer makes me really, really sick. And so, uh, and so I never well, I think had some any, of these things are an acquired had... taste. Uh, yeah, no, I, I don't know. I, I, just, I just know that, uh, you know, a sip of beer just really, really makes me sick for days. And so I just never touched the stuff, and I probably got better grades because of it, because uh, I didn't yeah. I didn't party. Well, I think I think we've covered pretty much all the aspects. Anything else you can think no, of? No, I think this is I think this is pretty good. And uh, you know, maybe what I'll do is I start doing some of these uh, 
some of these self-improvement videos uh, you know I'm doing I'm doing a series called don't be someone else's bitch one of my friends who's an educator uh, in New York helped me come up with the idea for the name and and her thought was if it's a little bit edgy then people will remember it you don't want you, know, you obviously don't want to you know make it too edgy where you have to bleep the whole thing out but if you make it a little bit of an edgy title and get people's attention and then uh, you know and I want to do kind of short concise summaries of these are the things what that you I found. What you basically mean is you want to have control over your own life. Yeah, basically, you want to you want to be able to you want to be able to choose the path that you want, choose your own destiny, and walk that path. And that's how I, you know, I I define success maybe as a little bit different than other people. I know, I know a lot of people who are very wealthy who live who live frankly miserable lives. Um, they they have a terrible marriage. They're they've got a lot of debt that they're juggling, or they're doing you know having all ki kinds of personal problems. Your kids are and, messed up, yeah. Right, and, and uh, you know, and I went to school with some people like that, too. But how, how I define success is if I want to do something, I want to have the means to do it on my terms. I want to be able to choose, I'm going to fly to Europe next week, and then I'm just going to go. Or I'm going to go invest in a new, in a new project. I'm going to go build a new business. I'm going to go design this thing. I'm going to go build a... Uh, build a, a porch, a, you know, a big, big barbecue porch or whatever, whatever it is I want to do. You know, if I come up with the idea, I want to be able to do it and I don't want to have to ask anyone else's permission. And, you know, the whole reason I bought a house instead of renting an apartment is I don't want to have to ask anybody's permission if I want to plant a tree. Uh, I like trees. I really like trees. I want to plant lots of trees. And since I own my own house, I can plant however many trees I have room for and I don't have to ask anybody. Or, you know, if I want to uh, you know, change out the toilet or if I want to, you know, I, I want to be able to do what I want to do on my own terms when I want to do it. And I think that, I think that's really having control over your life. Right. That, that, that makes you happy. You know, it's, it's having, being in control of as much as you can. And there's so many aspects of life that you have no power over. You know, you can't really determine if there's going to be a natural disaster or, uh, you can't really determine, you can't, you have no control over what other people are going to do necessarily, but as you gain control over your own life, and you can start insulating yourself from external problems, and, you know, that's, that's how you can sort of choose your purpose, choose your destiny, and, and pursue it, and try like hell to, to make it, accompl to accomplish it, and that's kind of the whole American dream, you know, the whole idea, you know, the whole, the whole idea behind America is, I'm going to do my thing, and I'm going to work my ass off, I'm going to work smart, I'm going to work hard, and I'm going to achieve what I, what I feel like. And, and that's sort of the, uh, and that's, 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 that's how I sort of define, define success. You know, if I ever become a billionaire, then maybe I'll change my mind on what success is. But uh, since I'm not a billionaire yet, uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to aim for the goals that make me happy. And, uh, you know, the fact that if I don't want to mow my lawn, I can pay somebody to mow my lawn. If I don't want to answer the phone, I can pay somebody to answer the phone. I can live my life on my terms. And that's made a big di difference. I, I was talking to the, uh, to the cashier at the grocery store the other day, and we were talking a little bit about success. And, and I told her the day that I realized I was successful was the day that I could go to the grocery store, buy whatever I want, and not worry about the bill, and I knew that I had enough room on my credit card to swipe the card and buy it, yeah, I'd pay it off later, but, you know, if my grocery bill's $100 or $200, I'm not, I'm not worried about it. I can buy the healthy food, I can buy the food I want to eat, and, you know, obviously I don't splurge, I don't do, like, crazy stupid, uh, you know, I'm not blowing money on hookers and blow, but, uh, I think that's, that's the, uh, that's the term that they, that they use. But, uh, you know, I don't, I don't buy crazy stuff. I'm not going to go and, and, you know, buy a Ferrari on payments that I can't afford. But, you know, if I need something, you know, I needed, I needed new eyeglasses because my old eyeglasses were scratched up. And I like your new ones. I like them, too. Uh, you know, the, it, the prescription's a little weird. I'm still getting used to it. I'm not, I'm not sure if, if, it's, if the lenses are right or not. I may have to go back. But... You know, just being able to go and say, I want these glasses because I like the way they fit on me. You know, they, they fit very comfortably. And I didn't have to look at the price. 
they weren't super expensive. You know, they weren't the cheapest ones, and they weren't the most expensive ones. But you know, if these if these were hundred dollar glass or two hundred or three hundred or four hundred dollar glasses, you know, I could have dealt with it. You know, throw it on the credit card, pay it off over time or whatever. But you know, I the fact that I can get what I want. Uh, no, I'm not going to go buy a new pair of eyeglasses every week. But you know, within reason, I can do whatever I want, and I kind of see that as I see that as a measure of success. Or if I you know, if I want to take a half hour out of my day to go work out, I can do it. Nobody can tell me no. You know, I schedule it around the meetings that I have. I go work out. I hop in the shower, and I'm good to go for the next meeting. Or now that, uh, you know, now that I'm working from home because of the virus, if I go hop in the shower and I don't have to, or if I go uh, work out and I don't have time to hop in the shower afterwards, you know, everything's all done remotely. They're not going to know, and I can go take a shower after my meeting uh, and, and just sort of suck it up and feel a little grungy. But the the fact that uh, you know I think I think that if people had the means to do what they wanted, and if they started equating success with the ability to do what they want, not with just raw money, money's kind of a trap. You know, if you pursue how do I want to say this? If you pursue wealth to the exclusion of all other aspects of life, you're going to be miserable. And people need to understand that money is a tool, and not the goal. You know, money is just the lubrication that makes the economy work. Money is the lubrication that allows you to get your stuff done. You know, like, like with my credit cards, my credit is just a lubrication. You know, I still have to work for my money. I still have to work and expend effort, right? I still have to use my mind and my body. And, and having the resources or having the credit will, will make it easier because I, you know, it insulates you from the bumps. But there's so many people who are out there just pursuing wealth just for the sake of wealth and just for the sake of showing off. And I'll get into this probably in other videos about how just living below your means. One of the best decisions I ever made was I bought a house that I could afford. I don't have to worry about the payments that much. You know, you uh, if I bought some expensive house where I was paying, you know, three, four times as much, then, then I'd have to stress. And... Um, and so by, by having not just the physical health and the energy, but then also the, by achieving the luxury where I can spend time to pursue long-term goals that, that, are more, that are more meaningful to me, that are, that are along the lines of what I want to achieve, then that, uh, that I see as success as well. A side factor, and we don't need to get into it in detail here, but just basically surrounding yourself or communicating with people that are worth the time and trouble and doing yeah. for others. You know, within a, an intact family, the often the father's the one out earning or earning the bulk of the money. Uh, the mother may earn money or um, deal with the kids and so forth. Everybody kind of doing for everybody else and even teaching the kids to do chores around the home that everybody pitches in as best they can does for other people. Or if you have friends, you might help them with something and then they help you with something. And it's very re rewarding to have a relationship with other people where everybody's doing the best they can to kind of help, e yeah. help each other out. Well, what, what, uh, what, I, what I found in business, and this is, uh, I could do a whole video on, on, on this, on, on staffing. But what I found is that it's much better to find a good person who's smart and resourceful and honest. Even if they don't know what they're doing, you can teach a smart, honest person how to do the job if they've got good ethics, if they've got... You know, if they're hard working, but you could have the most skilled person in the world. And if they're if they're dishonest, if they're a thief, if they're a crackhead, if they're lazy, you're, you're never going to you're, you're going to get screwed. You're never going to make anything uh, or you're never going to make anything out of that relationship. And so investing in investing in people, uh, you know, there's there's some people over the years that I've worked with where you know i really invested a lot of time into them and and they went and achieved fantastic things you know i benefited while they were working for me and then they went off using what they learned working for me to go do great things on their own and uh and then they're and now they're a resource that i can call on hey i've got this question um you know you you did the you did the the tech manual for this thing what you know what can you tell me about this problem i'm having or you know just just building up a resource of of good honest people that have your back and you've got theirs that's uh 
But I think I think we're going way off topic now, so I think I'll probably wrap it up, and we'll save that for for another for another video. But uh, okay, well it, it was fun tonight. I I had a good time. It was good hanging out with you, and uh, you know it's kind of sorry you've been so busy recently that we hadn't been able to catch up. But um, let's uh, let's do okay. this again. Ho hopefully, uh, hopefully people enjoy this kind of content, and and if you like what I'm doing. Please, uh, please share the video, like the video, tell your friends about it, and uh, you know, and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more of this stuff. Dad, do you have any any last words? Have a good night. We'll All see right. You. Good night, everyone, and I will uh, see you next video. Goodbye. <laughs>